This is a video about the chemistry related to coolant and also to brake fluid and to uh, battery acid. All, uh, all three of these have chemical properties that we test as a uh, mechanic. So first we're gonna check is coolant. So we do have little strips that make it a little bit easier. Uh, we have long pliers. Uh, needle nose pliers so you could dip it into the coolant. I already had the cap off. You dip that down inside the coolant and then you need to wait like 30 seconds. And it's a pretty simple process of reading it. So let that sit about 30 seconds. And then you have a chart here, okay? So it's a, a kind of hard to read, but we'll do our best. I'll take my glasses off. All right, so now the first one is the boiling point and the freeze point, okay? The top one tells you uh, it, what the boiling point is and the freeze point. So it looks like we're about this one right here. So our uh, freeze point is zero degrees and our boiling point is 256 degrees. So zero for freezing, 256 for boiling. There's some confusion with my students what these mean right here. This is different types of antifreeze, blue coolant, red coolant, green coolant. Um, technically it's Dexacool, which is, was orange. Uh, so, but it's pretty much the same uh, depending on what uh, coolant you're using. Okay, so the next one checks alkalinity. So if you're in the green, you're done, but we're not in the green. We're over in the, the far right here. So then that's telling us to go to the next step, okay? So the next step is to check our pH level. So our pH level is in the uh, green right here, so we're good. It might have been good if we were alkalinity was right, but the alkalinity wasn't uh, right, so then we went to pH and our pH is good. We don't need to change our coolant at this time based on this strip. Most shops do not have this tool. This is a refractometer, okay? So a refractometer is now trying to get into the real science of this. And what you do is you take a little droplet and you, you suck up a little bit of coolant and you just put a drop onto the screen there. You close the flap and then you gotta hold it up to light and this will tell you your, your freeze point with your coolant, okay? So I will find a picture online to show you what it looks like inside the peeps, the site. You can also use this for battery acid too. Although I'm really cautious with doing battery acid because look how close it is to your eye. But you could use this for coolant or battery acid. Okay, here's another type of a antifreeze hydrometer. And so what you have to do with this is you're gonna suck up the mixture of coolant that's in there. And you're gonna look on this side, it tells you the freeze up temp. And on this side, it, I think this, I got it right. Oh, this side's the freeze point, sorry. This side's the boiling point. So let's get that done. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna look at where that float is. And since I'm looking at the um, boil over side, it actually says that the boil over temp is 258. And on this side, it's telling me the freeze point is about, oh, somewhere between minus 12 and minus 18. And let me flip it around, see the boiling point? Yeah. And this side shows you the freezing point. Got it. And then I'm gonna put this back in the car. Here's a typical bottle of antifreeze, and this is the kind that you have to mix yourself. We call it a concentrate. And so typically in San Diego, we mix it 50-50 because we have pretty mild climate here. But if you live in a different part of the country, you may have to adjust your mixture. So if you live in a colder part of the climate uh, country, you're going to adjust this with a higher concentration of antifreeze to water inside here. And so that also, that hydrometer tells you what the concentration is. You can adjust it as necessary and retest it to make sure you have the correct protection. All right, so we have a voltmeter. I'm gonna actually switch the voltmeter to DC volts, which is the straight line with the dots. And we're, we're gonna use this to test our, bra our brake fluid and also to test our, uh, um, our coolant for what we call electrolysis. So as coolant and brake fluid become corrosive, they have a voltage uh, buildup over time. 
and you don't want to go over 0.3 volts in either fluid. If you do, then the, it's become corrosive and it eats away from the inside. So it's real simple. You stick one end into the, in this case, the coolant, and you touch the other end to some kind of ground. And you don't want to see a reading that's over point, or well, this is in millivolts. So this is actually a good reading. So this is 20, roughly 30 millivolts, which would be equal to 0.0, on this now I'm at four, so 0 0.045 volts, okay? So 48, 49 millivolts, now it's at 50, so it's climbing. Um, but we don't wanna see this number, this zero turn to a three or higher, which if this was a this is a millivolt, so 59 millivolts. If it was in volts, this would be 0 0.061. So it is climbing, but we pass. I'm very happy. I don't have uh, electrolysis in this. When fuel is burned inside an engine, a huge amount of heat is generated. This heat is managed by the engine cooling system. Cooling systems are filled with a chemical coolant antifreeze that has a higher boiling point and a lower freeze point than water. In the past, this was usually a green colored fluid. However, many manufacturers now use long life coolants, which may be orange, red, blue, or yellow. Coolant is forced into the bottom of the engine by a water pump, usually driven by either a timing belt or serpentine belt. The coolant then flows around the walls of the cylinders, removing heat generated through the burning of fuel. The coolant flows through the passages in the cylinder head gasket into the cylinder head, again removing heat from the top of the cylinders. The thermostat valve keeps the coolant trapped inside the cylinder head until the coolant temperature reaches a preset level at which the engine runs most efficiently. At this point, the thermostat opens to allow coolant to flow into the radiator. As air passes over the radiator, heat is transferred from the radiator to the air, lowering the temperature of the coolant so that the cycle can start over. Radiator is a heat transfer device used to remove heat from the engine coolant. It is usually constructed from aluminum with plastic end tanks. Small tubes run the length of the radiator with small metal fins in between each tube. As air travels over the pipes, either from the vehicle moving or because the radiator fan is pulling air through the radiator, the heat from the coolant is transferred to the air and the cooled fluid travels back to the engine. Radiators can develop leaks, either as a result of an object hitting the radiator and puncturing the outside or because the coolant has not been replaced regularly and has become acidic, eating away the metal inside the radiator. Debris floating within the cooling system can also collect in the small tubes, restricting coolant flow through the radiator. This will cause the engine to run hot, especially while climbing long hills or under heavy acceleration. Now let's go ahead and check our, cool, our brake fluid. So I'm gonna wipe this off. And brake fluid, just like coolant, becomes corrosive over time. You stick that into the brake fluid and then you just touch any part of the uh, motor that's ground. And look, this is a little more corrosive. So we're not at the three, uh, 300 millivolt mark or the 0 0.3 volt mark, but we're pretty darn close. We're at 240 millivolts. If it gets above 300 millivolts, and since I should probably clarify, the M means millivolts. So the decimal place when it's an M gets moved over th three places to the right. Oh, there we go, now we have 300. So our brake fluid is corrosive. And over time, that will eat away your brake lines. So we should really change our uh, uh, brake fluid because it is corrosive based on electrolysis. Our coolant, doesn't have a lot of electrolysis so we really don't have to change it and it passed on the hydrometer it passed on the strips so the coolant we don't need to change brake fluid it fails electrolysis test we need to change it and the chemistry behind brake fluid is that brake fluid is hydroscopic which means it attracts moisture from the air brake fluid straight out of the bottle its boiling point is close to 400 degrees and if you guys know a little bit about water, water's boiling point is 212 degrees. So the more water content that we have inside the brake fluid, the lower the boiling point is. And we never want the fluid to boil in the line. So 
many manufacturers make this really neat tool that measures the moisture content. You can measure dot three fluid, dot four, or dot five, depending on what's in your system. This system uses dot three. And all we have to do is stick this little probe into the brake fluid and watch the results. And so what it's telling me is that there is about uh, a little more than 1% of moisture content inside our brake fluid. And that's not really very good. It means it's time to flush it out. It's not in the red yet, but it'd be a good idea to flush it pretty soon and we'll get it back down into the green area. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so the one I'm going to use does the same thing. It measures uh, uh, the amount of flu water in brake fluid, but it does it by boiling it. It's an O2C brand. You hook it up to battery right here. Okay, and then you got to hook the other side up to some kind of ground. So let's find a good ground. Yep, that's a good ground. Any bolt's a good ground. Okay, now the problem is, is some massive cylinders you could put this in this one you can't but this boils the fluid so i never want to boil fluid in my uh, massive cylinder so i'm actually going to suck this up and i'm going to put this in here i'm going to have to rinse this off afterwards that's fine Okay. All right, so now what you do is you put this inside your brake fluid. You gotta have the, there's a little hole there. You gotta have that hole on top covered. And then you hold the blue button and it's gonna actually boil the fluid. And you can see it says heating fluid. See that? And it's heating the fluid and it's going to tell us and you can see a little bit of steam coming up see that and it's going to tell us what the boiling point was of the fluid the more water in the fluid the lower the boiling point it's that simple all right boiling point 365 for dot three the minimum boiling point is 284 we're good if it was dot four rated we, the minimum boiling point is three to one three eleven and uh, our boiling point is 365, so that is a pass. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some water to this, and we're going to see how that affects the boiling point. So Mr. Lear talked about brake fluid being hydroscopic. Okay, Hydroscopic means if you add water to it, it absorbs the water. So watch it go as it goes inside. And you can see the water in the fluid. So there's some water. That should be enough. And then, But then when I mix it, it disappears. It's hydroscopic. It absorbs the fluid. By just doing that, my boiling point is going to be a lot lower. And you can actually hear it. Boiling point 308. So, if this was dot four fluid, it would fail because 311 versus 308. So just adding water to the fluid made the fluid fail. Okay, so brake fluid absorbs moisture over time. You need to change your brake fluid. Like right now, we just got done with the rain. And uh, if you ha uh, had the cap off your massive cylinder, that moisture is going right into your uh, massive cylinder drop in the boiling point. So change your fluid. Okay, so these are uh, brake strips. They measure the corrosion level on the brake fluid. You don't want to be up around two to three hundred because that is when you need to replace your fluid. Uh, you want to be as close to zero as possible. So let's go ahead and put this in. Just dip it inside your massive cylinder. It gives you a long dip. Shake off the extra, and then it's just a matter of reading. These strips are actually very expensive. This tube is uh, like about 30 bucks uh, or more, okay? And you just measure the brake fluid, and it looks like we're about, uh, I'd say about 30. So the fluid's not bad. It is dirty. So with the corrosion um, strips, uh, it passes. So we passed on the moisture, and we passed on the... Uh, the strips and copper level.
Brake fluid is hygroscopic, meaning it absorbs moisture. Over an extended period of time, it is possible for moisture to enter the brake system through rubber hoses and seals. As moisture is absorbed into the brake fluid, the temperature at which the brake fluid boils decreases. Brakes can become very hot when stopping, especially when traveling down hilly terrain. When the heat in the brakes surpasses the boiling point of the brake fluid, the brake fluid will begin to boil. Boiling produces gas bubbles within the brake fluid. Gas is easily compressed, so the brake pedal will feel soft and will travel further than normal. This can greatly reduce the efficiency of the braking system. Although normal braking will resume when the fluid cools down, brake fluid should be replaced according to the maintenance schedule in order to remove any moisture or contaminants. Another area of the car where we're going to use a little chemistry to test things out is when we're talking about testing a battery. And one of the things you want to do is you can always test the voltage in the battery with a voltmeter. This one reads 12.3. It's almost fully charged. But another really good test for a battery is to test the concentration of the fluid. More, more so we're testing the specific gravity of the fluid inside each cell. And so we're going to have to access the cells by using a screwdriver to pop these caps off. You want to wear some gloves and be a little bit careful of the liquid in here because battery acid is caustic and it can irritate your skin and certainly damage your eyes. And so if we take a look inside this, there are six different cells, and we can use a tool called a hydrometer to measure the specific gravity. And so this, this particular one uses a little float inside here with a needle and a scale. And what we're looking for is the specific gravity should be right about 12.75 for each cell. So make sure you get this down into the electrolyte fluid in there, get a good suck up of fluid in there. And what we're going to do is take a look at where that float is. And that's looking a little bit low right there. Squeeze the fluid back into that cell because we're going to go on and test the next one now. Okay, that one's sitting a little bit higher. So what I'm noticing already is there's a difference between the cells, which isn't good. Let's check the next one. That one's reading fair condition. Fair condition again. Let's test the last one. And that one's in fair condition also. So one of the things that I notice is five of the cells are reading the same and one is different. And that's going to indicate a bad cell inside this battery. So when I set the tool down, you notice a little puddle there. That's not water. That's actually the battery acid. We refer to that to as an electrolyte. And one of the ways I can neutralize that is simply with baking soda. If I leave that on there long enough, it'll eat through that paint. and It'll actually corrode through the metal. If you just take a little baking soda, we can neutralize that. And you can see the fizzling and sizzling. That's the neutralizing with the battery acid going on there. So that can certainly irritate your skin. If you have a cut in your skin and that gets into there, boy, is that going to hurt. And if you get it in your eye and your nose and your mouth, it's going to really burn badly. So you got to take a lot of care when you're working around batteries. So we have a couple of other hydrometer tools here. This is the one I just showed you. This is a different style. It also uses a float inside, very similar. And then this one uses these little discs that float inside and you can determine your um, concentration by the number of discs that float in here. So here's the one with the discs in it. Actually the scales on this side. So here we got three, well it's about two and a half. And what it says on here, if I could see it, this one works a little bit differently. You want to suck the electrolyte up in there and then you're going to count the number of discs that are actually floating in the fluid. And it looks like we got three discs floating. And if I look at this chart, three discs floating is 1.222. Which is 75% charge. Yeah, which is 75% charge. And one disc not floating. Yep. Four discs would be flo uh, fully charged. There you go, just read it there. Okay.
There's never a convenient time to have a dead battery in your vehicle. Whether you're starting the day and trying to get to work or trying to get to an important event, why do batteries wear out? And what can you do to make sure that yours is always ready when you need it? Batteries have a typical life of about three to five years, and that life can be affected by factors such as how frequently you drive, the length of your journeys, and the temperature of the battery. Inside your battery, there are plates filled with lead and lead oxide. We'll refer to that as the active material, sitting in a bath of sulfuric acid. Each time you start the engine, a little bit of the active material can be released into the acid. And as the material wears down, the battery holds less charge. If your vehicle is driven infrequently, a chemical reaction called sulfation occurs, with crystals forming on the active material. This insulates the material from the acid and reduces the power of the battery. Constant high temperatures reduce battery life due to accelerated chemical reactions. But cold temperatures also reduce the power output of the battery, meaning that the battery must work harder to start an engine when it's cold. Leaving on an interior light so that the battery becomes discharged will also reduce battery life. Since none of us can control the weather, how can you make sure your battery is always charged and ready? During a vehicle inspection, it's normal to use specialist equipment to test the battery's health. Even though your battery might seem able to start your vehicle right now, a specialized battery tester can show when it's near the end of its life so that you can have it replaced before it leaves you stranded.